Welcome everybody to Element Church. So glad you are joining us. I want to give a shout out to everybody in St. Charles, Warrington, everybody watching online from coast to coast and around the world. Let's welcome one another this weekend. So glad you're here. Week two of our new series. We're talking about infinitely more and we're talking about God's perspective today of infinitely more. There was a guy who needed a new hunting dog, so he was looking through the classifieds, and he sees this ad that catches his eye, Miracle Hunting Dog, $5,000, must see. And the guy's thinking, man, that is a lot of money for a hunting dog, but Miracle Hunting Dog? I got to check this out. So he calls the owner and says, I'd love to see this Miracle Dog that you have. Goes out the next day at the scheduled appointment, meets the hunting dog, meets the owner. And the owner says, look, I can't explain what miracle working power this dog has. You just have to see this thing in action. So they go out to the pond and some birds fly by and the owner shoots. A bird falls down into the water. The hunting dog steps onto the water, walks on top of the water, picks up the bird, walks on top of the water all the way back. The guy goes, Oh my gosh, that is incredible. That is a miracle working dog. I'll take it. Shells out the $5,000, gets the dog home. He can't wait to show his brother his new hunting dog. Now, his brother is the ultimate pessimist. He sees the negative in everything. So his brother goes, I can't believe that you spent $5,000 on a hunting dog. You're an idiot. And so he goes, no, you, you just got to see this thing. So they go out to the pond the next day shoots, bird falls down, the hunting dog steps on the water, walks on the water, picks up the bird, walks all the way back on top of the water. The owner's like, look at that, isn't that amazing? What do you think? His brother says, well, it seems to me you bought a dog that can't swim. <laughs> perspective. We are looking at how to have the right perspective, God's perspective, of what he wants to do inside of your life. And we looked last week at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 from the ISV translation, and we see an incredible statement here from God. We're going to look at it again. Now to the one who can do, what are those words? Infinite. Say it like you're excited about it. Infinite. Then all we can ask, imagine, according to the power that is working among us. God truly wants to do infinitely more than all you can ask, think, Imagine inside of your life personally, inside of your family, and not only that, but inside of this family, inside of this church family. God wants to bless a local church, each local church. Why? Because God wants to use each church to make a difference, to do infinitely more inside of every community, to reach more people for Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at something that was exciting for us as a church that God has infinitely more for us than all we've thought, asked, or imagined. And I shared some exciting things that are coming up for us. And I know many people uh, miss that. On average, more than half our church is not in any campus on any given weekend because people are traveling, kids are sick, uh, different reasons. And so uh, any given weekend, half our church didn't hear what the other half heard. So I'm just going to give us a little bit of a recap about some exciting things coming up. Now, we have many guests that attend each week, all of our campuses, people tuning in, checking us out online. I just want to make this statement. If you're a guest and you're visiting, we are honored and we're excited that you're here. And what we're doing today is we aren't asking anything from you, okay? We don't want something from you. What we actually want is something for you. And so what we're going to be sharing is very exciting for our church family. And at the end of the day, it's really for you. We want to help you uh, and those that maybe don't know Christ. So that's what these exciting things are coming up about. Now, so if you're a guest, you can kind of go, oh, okay, the pastor's not asking me for money. Guys, the church just wants our money. Nope, we just want something for, for you. Now, uh, we have some exciting upgrades that we're going to be doing here at the Winsfield campus, St. Charles campus, Warrington campus, and it's regarding our kids' ministries. For 18 years now, it's been in my heart to have a world-class environment for our kids' ministries. We have great ministry in the classrooms, but we want to create an environment that's exciting and dynamic for those kids. We believe that the future of the church is our next generation. Amen. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is when Joshua conquered the promised land in the book of Judges. There's this verse that says, 
And after Joshua and that generation passed away, there arose another generation who knew not the Lord nor the things of the Lord. The church is always one generation away from extinction. And if you look around the world today, the world controlled by Satan is after our kids. And it's so important that we do everything we can as a church to capture the hearts and the imaginations of our kids for Jesus Christ. Abraham Lincoln had an amazing quote. He said this, Our children are a timeless message that we will send into a generation that we will never see. What message are we sending that next generation? I'll tell you what Element Church is sending as a message. We love kids because God loves kids. And so I want to show you some exciting things that are coming up for all of our campuses And we're going to take a look at this. I'm going to do some commentary over the top of this video. Uh, We abbreviated this uh, from last week, so those that saw it. uh, This is our new mascot. His name's Gobi One. Isn't that cool? Animated face. Uh, The theme is going to be exploring God's creation. Romans chapter 1 says that the creation declares the glory of God. Psalm says the creation declares the glory of God. Paul says that all men are without excuse because of creation. We believe that our kids will get to experience the power and wonder of God as we take them through creation. So inside of our preschool with those really cute looking uh, animals, uh, there'll be an underwater theme for the nursery, then it goes up to different continents. There's going to be a panda room, come on. Yeah, I love pandas. And then as kids get older, they're going to move into our like our first, second, and third grade here at the Wentzville campus. We'll move into more of uh, exploring through planes and traveling like that. But as our kids move into the fourth and fifth grade, and this is probably what St. Charles and Warrington type campus will get for your bigger kid classrooms, going to be more of the spaceship feel. And uh, this is kind of like you're inside of the helm of, of, of Star Trek or something with Star Wars, because we believe that uh, we can explore the universe in terms of just seeing God's creation. And uh, so exciting things for the kids. How many go, man, I wish I was a kid again. Yeah. Uh, good luck with that. But you can be a volunteer in our kids' ministry and enjoy some really cool stuff for kids. Our youth ministry is going to get some exciting upgrades as well. Now, I want to show you our new auditorium that we are going to build here at the Wentzville campus. Look around here at the Wentzville auditorium. We're full. uh, We're packed. Uh, The next service is going to be the same. Our campuses are growing. St. Charles, Warrington, you guys are growing. And so we need to make room here at the Wentzville campus. And so uh, if you don't know, we own another 100,000 square feet here of this campus that we aren't currently utilizing that God gave us for such a time as this. And that is we're going to build a 1600 seat auditorium. I wanna show you a little video of what this is going to look like. Very excited about this. Uh, As we build more into the mall space at the center of the mall, we we own that. Uh, It's that beautiful skylight. Uh, We could have a really cool big Christmas tree, uh, a lot more seating, a lot more environment. Uh, So that's going to be our biggest part of our new lobby space. From there, as you go into our new auditorium, uh, you can just see how much bigger it is. The ceilings are going to be significantly higher. You can see how large that stage is, how high the proscenium is. Uh, This isn't the exact colors and designs in it. We're just showing you what it's going to look like. 800 seats on the floor, 800 seats in stadium seating. There is a good seat anywhere inside of the house. And uh, so now you might be going, well, man, I'm at St. Charles, I'm at Warrington, what in the world? I'm watching online, how in the world does that help me? I'll tell you how it helps you. Your experience is going to be significantly better because when I'm teaching here at this campus, we're streaming that into our campuses, Uh, you're watching online. Because of the, the significant upgrades that we're going to do inside of the auditorium, the larger ceiling, our lighting's better, the video equipment's better, the video wall behind us is better. In all ways, you're going to have a better experience when we stream into your campus there online, so the quality of what you get is going to be significantly better. What we can do for Christmas, what we can do for Easter, just exponentially goes up. We're looking at all the different theatrical things that we can incorporate. I mean, it doesn't... Who, who doesn't want to see Pastor Leo on a zip line wearing leotards, being a little baby angel <laughs> at Christmas time? Like, I mean, that, that's just worth coming. So there's uh, more exciting things that we're doing. I uh, don't have time to get into all that, but I would love for you, if you didn't pick up your One Life booklet, it explains the project 
explains the vision, uh, gives you much more details about what we're doing. There's pictures in there uh, and um, answers a lot of the questions that you have. Uh, so pick that up. There's testimonials, devotionals, a uh, place to take sermon notes. So uh, pick that. You can also scan that. I know many people, you know, on a weekend, we have more people watching us online around the world than we do sitting inside of all of our physical campuses combined. And so those of you online who attend Element, uh, scan that code, get your digital copy of your workbook so you can see all the exciting things. How many think that's cool? Yes. Thank you. Very exciting stuff. Now you might be thinking, that's awesome. How do we get there? Well, all we need (laughs) to get there is a small price tag of $10 million over the next three years above our regular tithes and offerings. So the good news is we already have it. The bad news, it's in your pocket. (laughs) I'm going to tell that as long as you keep laughing. That's such a great joke. (laughs) Now, uh, if you're a guest, again, we're not asking anything from you. But if this is your church, this is your home, you love Element, you get fed at Element, your life's being changed at Element, here's what we're asking. Actually, honestly, I believe it's what God's asking of us, individually and us corporately. Would we go on a spiritual journey of learning to trust God to get it to us so he can get it through us over the next three years so we can see this vision come to pass? It's not about a building. It's not about a project. It's about people. It's about the Josh video that we just saw about how his life was changed, how his wife wrote his name on a card. And that name is actually buried right here under this platform. His name is here under this platform because we all came together that were part of that campaign, part of that project, and we put all the names of people we were believing God to get saved, their life to be changed, and we buried it right under this platform in a prayer event. And there's hundreds and hundreds of names here. We're going to do something very similar in this next project because it's not about buildings, it's about reaching people for Jesus Christ. And I believe God wants us to go on a journey of infinitely more so that we can learn to experience the infinitely more that he has for you individually and for us corporately as a church. I want to share a passage that helps enlarge our thinking when it comes to infinitely more. Isaiah 55 verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. That means I'm thinking infinitely more than you. Your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. God is saying, my thoughts towards you are so big, the only illustration I could give you is just go out and look into the heavens. Because as high as the heavens are above the earth, so much higher are my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, when it's talking about heavens, it's not just talking about the clouds, it's talking about the heavenly universe that's above us. And so I want to show just how big that actually is. So this is how large the universe is. is. The edge of the known universe is that many miles away. Don't know what number that is, but obviously it's pretty big. Now, you and I can't fathom that, so we're going to just practically try to help us understand how much greater your, God's thoughts for you are than your thoughts for you. Now, if you could drive at 65 miles an hour to the edge of the universe in your little Prius. Now, I know it's a Prius because you're going 65. Because that's the maximum speed limit on every Prius in the fast lane blocking me. Now, so if you're driving at 65 miles an hour, To reach the edge of the known universe, it's going to be 4.8 times 10 to the 17th power of zeros. I have no clue what number that is, but here's what I know. You're going to be incredibly old when you get there. Okay? Now, here is a way to help just kind of fathom how long it would take driving at 65 to get to the edge of the universe. There have been... A little over 100 billion people that have been born, that have lived since Adam and Eve walked the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago. 100 billion people. Now imagine in your car, because you don't really have anything else to do, you get to watch a documentary 
of every single person that has ever lived. Not just like edited two hour. You get to watch every moment of their entire life, every second, real time. So if it's somebody lived to be 85, that's an 85 year video. Let's be honest. Most people's videos are really boring. Why? Because they don't want to trust God for infinitely more experiences. and Therefore, it's probably a pretty boring story. But you get to watch all 100 billion lives played out in real time. And then you get to watch a rerun. You get to watch it again and again and again. In fact, you get to watch all 100 billion people's lives 150 times. And guess how far you've reached? 100 billion people's lives, 150 times you've watched it played over real time. You're 1% of the way to the edge of the universe. I don't know if I can trust God with my light bill. Does God really want to do something to help me? Look, God says, my thoughts for you, you'll never even reach. You can't even fathom what I want to do inside of your life. We all want that. But notice this. God's thoughts are always followed by God's ways. Because God said, I have great thoughts, but my great thoughts are followed by greater ways than what you've thought or imagined. Like, God, I want the more. God says, great. Here's some ways that I want you to walk in. Well, no, I'm not. No, I'm good. I like my ways. I just want your thoughts, but I don't want your ways. I want your thoughts regarding my kids. I just don't want to parent your ways for my kids. God, I want your ways of infinitely more with my money. I just don't want to steward the money your ways. I'm going to do it my way, but I do want your infinitely more thoughts. It doesn't work that way. Because to have God's infinitely greater thoughts, we have to walk in God's infinitely greater ways. And so I want to talk for a moment about perspective. Because God's thoughts or God's perspective on things. So here's a thought as we're entering into this three-year journey. Here's a thought. Who owns it all? Because God has a perspective, and you probably have a perspective. The world has a perspective. And here's what we know. God's thoughts are infinitely greater than our thoughts regarding who owns it all. Now, it's not really confusing because God actually tells us And he makes it very simple, and he says this, Psalms 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. God says, the earth is mine, everything in the earth is mine, everyone inside of the earth is mine, everything on the earth is mine, because he created it. So here's the good news. Everything you have and everything you are belongs to God. And you're like, well, how in the world is that good news? I like being in control. I like being an owner. Well, here's the problem with being an owner. When you're an owner, it's your problem. See, some of you rent, and you're like, man, I kind of wish I was an owner. But here's one advantage to renting. When something breaks, (laughs) it's the owner's problem. When you understand that God owns you, that God owns your stuff, Now, here's the good news. God, something broke. It's your problem. God, I'm broke. It's your problem. God, I got these little things that belong to you running around. That's your problem. (laughs) See, when it's God's, it's God's problem. See, a lot of people think that God is trying to get their money. Do you really think God is up in heaven Twisting his hands going, how do I get that money? How do I get that fake stuff the United States government's printing? How do I get some of that? Because this gold throne I'm sitting on and these streets paved with gold, it ain't enough. I need some of that fiat currency. God ain't trying to get your money. What God is wanting from us is helping us understand All the things we're truly worried and stressed about, we shouldn't really have to worry and stress about because God's saying, I own it. And because I own it, I want to take care of it and I want to take care of you because as an owner, you're my responsibility. Secondly, God is saying, 
it's not your stuff I want, it's your heart I want. God isn't into things. God made the things. God could make more things. There's no lack of things that God has. But what God wants that he doesn't have is our heart. Now, he might have part of our heart. He might have a percentage of our heart. But God wants all of our heart. And Jesus summarized it best this way. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. So God knows the greatest way and fastest way to get our heart is when we take earthly treasure and we put it into his kingdom. He knows our heart follows that. Because at the end of the day, God simply wants our heart. Is he cruel and mean for wanting a heart? No. Why do you get married? Do you stand at the altar and say, I give you 50% of my heart. And I'll love you all the days of my life until it gets really inconvenient and I no longer like you, then we're done. No, you stand at the altar because I give you all of me and all that I am till death do us part. Like, that's what you want. You want that intimacy. And what God wants is he wants intimacy with us. It's not stuff, it's our heart. So let's look at what he says regarding ownership. Matthew 25, and verse 14. This is known as the parable of the talents. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a faraway country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them and told the one he gave five talents to another two, to another one, each according to his ability, and he immediately went on a journey. Now, a talent is equivalent to a one year's of wages. So that's a pretty significant sum of money. Even for the guy who just got one, that's still a year's salary. To the guy who had five, that's five years' salary. And so the point Jesus is emphasizing as it's his talents, it's his stuff. And he gave it to us to steward and manage. Now, when the word uh, stewardship really is, the word we would use today is manage. Uh, We don't walk around using the word stewardship a whole lot. It's a church word, a biblical word. But for us, we would say manage. So many of you, you have a financial manager. You have an investment broker that you sit down with, and they talk about your portfolio. They talk about your your net worth. They help with the state planning and strategy. And that's a good thing to have. And so they manage what you've entrusted to them. But it's your money. They manage it. So imagine you have a manager managing your money, and you go, you know what? I got an anniversary coming up. I'm going to do something special for my wife. So you go to the the manager and say, hey, I I need to take out a few thousand dollars of of that because I'm going to do something real special for my wife. It's our anniversary coming up. And they go, well, I'm sorry. We can't do that. Uh, Come again? Well, no, we, we can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Well, it's our money. Well, uh, no, it's my money that I gave to you to manage. It's my money. My name's on the statement. My name's on the brokerage statement. You're just a manager. Yes, but we consider it our money. Okay, how about this? I, I want to I expand my house. C- could I get some money out of my money to expand my house? Well, again, sir, I, I apologize for any inconvenience that you might be feeling, but it's our money. Now, how many of you go, I need a new brokerage firm? Because they're telling me it's no longer my money, and I no longer have access to my money. Now, what would you think if that person goes a step further and says, by the way, could you give us more? And we laugh, kind of (laughs) like, and we only go, (laughs) because we know that's us. Because God said, hey, I'm going to give you some of my stuff, and I'm going to ask you to manage it. But from time to time, I'm going to come in and go, hey, I'd like to get a little of that because I'm going to do something special for my wife called the Bride of Christ, the church. Hey, from time to time, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder and go, I've entrusted you with this, and I gave you more than you needed for such a time as this because I'm going to do an expansion inside of my house called the local church. Would, Would you be willing to, like, I want to make a withdrawal? But when we go, hey, God, it's, it's my stuff, it's my money, it's my precious, <laughs> but could you give me more? Flippian says you supply all my needs. <laughs> Read the verses that came before it. Paul said you were generous. You sent aid to me time and time again. 
Therefore, God will supply all your needs. Why? Because you supplied somebody else's needs. Let's move along because that was a little painful. We need a group hug, don't we? Group hug. Bring it. Bring it. Philippi, uh, Matthew chapter 25, moving on, verse 16. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. But he who had received the one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. Second thing we learn is this. It's not just God's money. It's not just God's stuff. He expects us to leverage it to gain more. God is wanting us to not just be consumers. God is wanting us to think as investors. God is saying, will you take what I give you and will you invest it wisely because I'm looking for a return on what I've entrusted to you. Now, I believe that this is both practical and spiritual. I believe God expects us to think like savers and investors in the natural, the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children, children. The Bible says a fool spends everything that he makes. Uh, so what's, what's the person who spends more than they make? The Bible didn't say, but whatever's below a fool. So God is expecting us to be wise in managing money. So 401k, retirement accounts, setting aside, buying assets versus liabilities. So there's a practical side to that. But I also believe that God is looking at the bigger side of it, and that is the eternal perspective. Because Jesus said, don't just store up treasures on earth where moth and rust and the corrupt Federal Reserve cartel destroys. But store up treasures in heaven where there's neither moth, rust, or destroy. And so Jesus is saying, don't just think about now, but think of the big picture. Think of eternity, because you're going to spend a whole lot longer in heaven than you are on planet earth. So I talk about this because it's one of the best illustrations I know, and that is life is like the game of Monopoly. And the more money that you accumulate, the more likely you are to win. And you want to accumulate property, rich dad, poor dad. You want to get some good assets that are going to generate some cash flow as your renters land on there. And then at the end, you bankrupt your friends, and you're the winner. Yay! But at the end of that game... It all goes back into the box, and hopefully you're still friends. I've, I've lost 50% of my friends at least playing Monopoly. They're just sore losers. They don't know how to lose with a good attitude. So what God is saying is this side of heaven, your money is really Monopoly money. Do you know the United States government has printed more money than Monopoly's printed? Technically, this is probably more value because if scarcity is what drives up demand, technically, you should go buy boxes of Monopoly money because that's actually worth more than whatever the U.S. government's shelling out. <laughs> so what God is saying is this. You're in the game of Monopoly called your life, and he goes, hey, I got a deal for you because this isn't real. The only reason the United States can continue to live with the debt level we have and the world live at the debt level we have is because we've all bought into the greatest Ponzi scheme of all time that it's real. Now, hopefully everybody will just continue to think it's real long enough for us to die before we run out or Jesus rapture us, okay? But it's not real. We just think it is. So God says, tell you what, you're in a game of monopoly. Tell you what, you you just give me some of this, and I'll give you some of this. Now, if you were actually in a game of Monopoly and your friend said, hey, I'll give you some $100 bills, give you these hondos for some of these, how many go, I I need to keep this? How many go, yeah, I'll take the hondos, Right. right? No brainer. Why? Because God is trying to say, hey, look, at the end of the day, you're in an economic system that is going to collapse. Yeah, but it didn't collapse in my grandparents' time. Will it collapse the day they died? Because they didn't take it with them. (laughs) It'll collapse the day you die or before you die, but either way, God is saying you can take what's not real and you can invest it into what is real, and that's what lasts forever. What we see in this journey of stewardship, of managing God's stuff, is there will always come a moment inside of our life as Christ followers where we'll have to learn to surrender. 
Now, surrender doesn't sound like a very exciting term. It sounds like you lost. But in Christianity, the way you win is surrender. When we say, not my will, but thy will be done. Last week, we looked at Abraham, the father of our faith. Uh, he was an incredible man. He was believing God for a son. He wanted to be a dad. And at 100 years of age, God fulfilled his promise to Abraham to make him a father of great nations through Isaac. And nations were born out of Abraham's seed, out of Isaac. And so the world was truly blessed. The Messiah came through that bloodline. So God fulfilled his word of infinitely more to Abraham. So Abraham is 100 plus years old. Isaac's a young man. We're not exactly sure how old he is. Some say 12 or 13. Some say as old as 33. But we do know this. Isaac was old enough to resist his dad. But God has a moment where he says, Abraham, I'm going to test you, and I want to just see, do you love the thing I gave you the most, or do you love the giver of the gift the most? Do you love me, or do you love the thing I gave you more? And so Abraham came to a moment of surrender at a place called Moriah. Genesis 22, verse 1, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And then he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. The word Moriah means foreseen. Because God foresees what is going to take place eventually on this mountain. Because the very mountain that God is telling Abraham to go sacrifice his son is the very mountain that God himself would sacrifice his son called Calvary. Several thousand years later, that's the very mount where Jesus would die. Now, there are people who read this passage and go, man, I got a problem with the Bible. I got a problem with the Old Testament. Because it seems to me that God is endorsing child sacrifice. It's actually the opposite. Every pagan nation around Abraham at this time all practiced child sacrifice, all of them. They had a god called Molech. They would take their firstborn child, put it on the incandescent burning arms, and place that child to burn to death on the arms of Molech, believing that the god of Molech would prosper them for sacrificing their children. So by God saying, take Isaac to Mount Moriah, Offer him as a sacrifice. Here's what we see. God stops that. We're going to read that here in a moment. Here's what God is actually telling Israel. I don't want you to sacrifice your kids for me to be blessed. I'm going to sacrifice my son for you to be blessed. God banished child sacrifice through this event. He didn't endorse it. He was putting an end to it. That's the greater picture of this. So Genesis 22 verse 5. So Abraham gets there, he journeys, he's got a couple servants with him, and Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. I love this faith. Hebrews 11, 17 gives the commentary as to why he believed we're coming back. Hebrews says that he reasoned that God could even raise the dead. Now that's great faith because up to this point we have no record of God raising anybody from the dead. But Abraham goes, God promised me that this son would be a blessing to all the earth. Therefore, if God says surrender it, it must be we're still coming back together down this mountain. What we get hung up on is on the word surrender. We think that God says take it up to the mountain and we're coming back empty handed. God isn't trying to to take something from your hands. He's simply trying to get more into your hands. But he can't get more in until we say, God, I'm willing to trust you. God, I love you more than the thing that you've given me. And when God knows we love him more than we love the things, God said, I could trust you more with the things because you understand the source. And you love the source more than the stuff. So he's at the top of the mountain, Genesis twenty two eleven. But the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here am I. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son uh, from me. And Abraham called the place of the Lord, the, the place the Lord will provide. As it is to this day in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now in the Hebrew, it's Jehovah Jireh. Now, if you've been around church for years, you know the song, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. And we love to talk about Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah, you know, my banner, and we get into Jehovah. And we go, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. But where was it 
that Abraham encountered Jehovah Jireh as the provider. It wasn't while Abraham was in his tent, and it wasn't when Abraham was at the bottom of the mountain. It wasn't when Abraham was halfway up the mountain. It was only when Abraham was at the top of the mountain, surrendered to God, did God show up as Jehovah Jireh. We have many Christians who are going, why isn't God being a provider? The question is, are you on the mountaintop? Are you learning to surrender? Because it's at a point of surrender that God shows up to provide as Jehovah Jireh. The bottom line is this, you can't outgive God. Because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son, God said, I will owe you nothing and no man will ever outgive me. Abraham, you gave me your son who's flawed and has all kinds of issues. I'm giving you my perfect son in the same place. Why? Because you can't outgive God. It's not God trying to get something from you. It's God trying to get something to you. God wants something for you, infinitely more than all you can ask or imagine, but that's always found on God's ways of surrender, being able to trust God. Now, as a church, people go, man, this church is just blessed, and we own 180,000 square feet of this entire mall complex. Did you know that? That's pretty cool, but many people don't know how we got there. When we launched Element Church, we were about two years old, we were running several hundred people, and I was believing God for a building like this. In my heart, I saw this, this type of church. I saw this 1,600-seat auditorium that we'll be building here in the near future. I saw all that inside of my heart. But we were renting the YMCA in Chesterfield. We were setting up and tearing down, and, and our offerings were two, $3,000 a weekend. Like, we're living penny to penny, not just paycheck to paycheck. Like, we're believing God... Uh, for, for literally one offering at a time to be able to pay our bills. Well, there was a church planter who also came to town and planted a church, and I had heard that uh, he, he launched his event, and, and he was very discouraged. It didn't go nearly as well. He had like eight people show up. He was expecting hundreds to show up, and he was just discouraged. And so as I was praying, God said, I want you to call that guy Take him out to coffee. Just encourage him. You're, you're a church planner. You have some stories. You can encourage him. Just love on him. I said, okay, God, I'll do that. So I call the guy, set up a coffee at Starbucks, and I'm driving there. Now, God sometimes doesn't tell you the whole thing because he knows you wouldn't have gotten in the car. I wouldn't have gotten in the car either. Now, I'm five minutes away from Starbucks. I can't really turn around because I know the guy's there waiting for me. So as I'm driving, God says this to me. He goes, I want you to tell that church planter the Element Church is going to give him $5,000 to help him with this church. I said, get thee behind me, Satan. I bind you and I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. It came to me again. I want you to get, give from Element Church $5,000. I like, God, have you looked at our checkbook lately? God didn't go, oh, I'm sorry, I should have checked that before I asked you. I'm like, God, we need $5,000. Tell somebody to give us $5,000, Jesus. Like, do, do you see the offerings? And he goes, Eric, this is a Mariah moment. Will you trust me for your church that I'm not trying to hurt you, but I'm trying to bless you? Like, you preach this stuff, Eric. You're right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So I get into Starbucks and I'm talking with the guy. He's just discouraged as heck. And I, I look at him and I just go, you know what, my friend, God told me on the way here to give you $5,000 from our church. He just burst into tears, snot's coming out of his nose. He's crying. I start crying. Half of Starbucks starts crying. They don't even know why we're crying, but it's just like, oh. I felt so good. I, can't, I couldn't buy that feeling for $5,000. I couldn't. So I get back in the car, and I get in my car. Now, I've had this about three times in my entire 39 years now as a Christ follower. As I'm in the car, I literally felt like a beam of light, a shaft of light opened up from heaven and just shone on me. Now, it didn't actually happen, but I felt it. And I heard the voice of God say to me this. It wasn't audible, but I know God's voice, and it was so strong. He said this. He goes, Eric, because you trusted me and because you gave, I'm going to do something that's going to blow your mind. Just watch what I'm going to do for Element Church. The next week, I get a phone call 
from a gentleman. He just started attending our church. And he goes, hey, pastor, I want to take you out to lunch. Now, when you're a church planner, you're always taking free lunches. Because, like, I just gave away $5,000. That is a lot of lunches. So I'm like, yeah, let's go to lunch. So he owns all kinds of businesses. In fact, he owned this entire building that we're in. And he goes, Eric, he goes, God's called me to make money. That's my gift. I, 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 I am gifted by God to make money. I have the gift of giving. I tithe and I give. But I have the spiritual gift, and I know it, to make money to accelerate the vision for the kingdom of God. And everything I touch turns into money. I go, well, touch me. <laughs> and he goes, so tell me your vision. So I'm like, man, I, I'm like, you know, man, we're going we're gonna to reach thousands of people. We're going to be satellites. We're going to have campuses. We're going to be the first church with the campus on the moon. We might even go to Mars. I mean, like, we're going to win the universe. Like, I'm just making up stuff because I know my vision needs to exceed this guy's checkbook. So he goes, that's awesome. He goes, what do you need? You, you, you need $100,000. You need a million dollars. I never heard that word before. A million dollars? And I go, I, I need clean underwear. That's what I need right now. Like, <laughs> serious? <laughs> wow. So he said, God's called me to help build this church. He goes, I got all this property over here. He goes, why don't you just move the church over here? Now, here's the thing. This is where I wanted to be. I knew we were called to have our main campus here in the O'Fallon, Lake St. Louis, Wentzful area, but nothing opened up. We started there by default. God got us where we needed to be, but he did infinitely more than all we could ask or imagine when he did it. And this, so the long story short, that gentleman gave over a half a million dollars to help Element Church get where we are. And ultimately, we own 180,000 square feet of this entire complex. How many go, that $5,000 trade to trust God was worth the more than half million that was given and the entire building that we're in. How many go, that was a good business decision, pastor. Yeah. But it was a Mar Mariah moment that I knew I can't outgive God. I live that way personally and I have for 39 years. We live that way as a church since we've launched 18 years ago and every single time God has shown up in a powerful way. We are at a Mariah moment for us as a church. This is the third significant, apart from that story, the third significant Mariah moment for us as a church. In 2011, I approached the church and I said, we've outgrown our 350 seat auditorium. It's our current uh, landing uh, auditorium where we were meeting. We had four services, we were packed. And I said, guys, we have the opportunity to build this current auditorium that we're in, but we need $1.5 million to do it. And we had several families, several hundred families that go, we'll go on the three year journey to raise above our regular giving $1.5 million so that we could expand so that we won't just become keepers of an aquarium, but that we can continue to be fishers of men, pastor we're in. And you know what? The church came through. How many of you have been touched by God inside of this auditorium? Maybe found Christ inside of this auditorium? That was because there were faithful people who said yes to go to the top of the mountain to trust God to build this for you. 2014, we had another Mariah moment. We went to the church and said, guys, I got good news. We have the opportunity to buy and own our space. And not only that, we can own another 100,000 square feet of space for us to expand inside of the future. But it's going to take us $5 million to do that. Would you trust God to go on a three-year journey with us, that God could get it to you, to get it through you so that we could raise the $5 million? You know what? I'm so proud of our church. They stepped up and pledged $5.8 million. Over $5 million came in. We own this space because there were people who said, God, use me. I'm willing to surrender. And I've heard story after story after story of God showing up in individuals' lives who were part of that spiritual journey. And many of you have come here, started our, attending our campuses since we went on that spiritual journey and God's saying, hey, good news. I don't want you to miss out. I want you to be part of this next major milestone in the life of Element Church. 
And this is for all of our campuses. This is for all those that call Element Church home. The question is, would you be willing to simply say, God, I will listen to you. What is it you want to say to me? What is it you want to do through me and through my family? Things I hadn't even thought of and even imagined because, God, here's what I know. I can trust you, that I will never be able to outgive you, and that I want to take what is temporary and I want to be able to transfer it into that which is eternal. I want to share something just very practically for you to be praying about as a church. And the first weekend of October, we're going to have a weekend that we call Commitment Weekend. And over the next several weeks, what we're doing is we're just praying and we're saying, God, what would you do with me? What would you do with my family? Again, if you're a guest and you're just kind of kicking the tires of Element Church, checking us out, I'm not, well, I'm not asking anything from you. But we are doing something for you as a church. But if this is your home and you go, man, I'm in, I love this church, it's changed my life, I, I believe in the vision of this church, then we're just saying, would you just be praying, saying, God, what is it that you could do through me? And then what we're going to do is we're going to come together and we're going to turn in we're asking to turn in a pledge card. Now, it's not a contract. It's not a legal binding contract. You can change it. You can up it. But what this, uh, I had a joke there, but I'm going <laughs> to not say that one. <laughs> but it's funny. Trust me. Just laugh because it was funny. All right. So uh, what this allows us to do is you just say, you know what? I'm believing God over the next three years to be able to give a certain sum of money. One thing it does is There's something about writing a vision. Habakkuk 2.2 says, write the vision, make it plain. All of a sudden, it becomes real. When you write something down, it becomes real to you, and now you got a goal. That's a goal. That's what I want to be able to believe God to be able to get through me. The second thing that it does is it allows us as a church to know where are we in this spiritual journey. Jesus said, sit down and count the cost. So we need to know how to pace the project so that we can cash flow as much of this project as we can, but it helps us as a church to know Where is our faith and where are we believing God to be able to do? The third thing is it allows us to work with banks. So the last two projects we did this, the third project, this one, we're going to do this as well. And that is we will cash flow as much of the project as we can. Uh, We will cash flow our kids' project and we'll cash flow about half of our construction for our new auditorium. But chances are uh, we'll take on a construction loan to finish our auditorium so we could get in sooner than later. And then if there's any balance left, we will just convert that to a note that uh, we believe the pledges will be able to pay off so it won't be a long-term debt that we have as a church. What banks will do is, in fact, it's the same bank we've worked with on the first two campaigns. They're working with us on this campaign. They'll loan us up to 70% of our pledges. So the bank looks at this because they know our church, they've worked with us for 15 years now. They know that when you guys make commitments, we can trust Element Church. This allows us to go to the bank, work with them to continue this project. So I want to show you the card. If you, if you need a digital copy, you can download that. Many people watching online, you could download that as well. But there's all kinds of ranges. Let's go ahead and just pull up that chart just so you can kind of see. It's not as, as scary as, as it seems. I mean, something as simple as $6 a week, $28 a month it could be thousand dollars over a year. And you know what? We need people to be able to give thousands of dollars a year. But the size of this project, we're going to need people that can pledge five thousand dollars over three years. We need people that can do fifty thousand dollars over three years. We need people who can do a hundred thousand dollars over three years. We need five hundred. We need a 750. I'm believing God for the first time in the history of our church to have a million dollar pledge. We have never in the history of our church had a million dollar gift. Just think, you could be the first. You can have Leo's parking spot. (laughs) Dr. John said he'll wash your car on the weekend for you. So, I mean, hey, it happens all the time. I I know pastors that they have people come up and go, I have a friend in Albuquerque. He just had, he's launching a campaign at the exact same time as him. His is $20 million campaign. I'm going to go, I'm glad I'm here right now, not the 20 million. (laughs) But he had a gentleman walk up on that night and he goes, Pastor, I'm going to be a million dollar gift for you. It's out there. But here's, What matters? It's not equal gifts. It's equal sacrifice. Because we're all at different points in our journey. For for some people, a $5,000 pledge would be like a million dollar pledge to somebody else. But God looks at, we are simply saying, I'll do what you asked me to do. Can you trust God to get it to you so that he can get it through you? Would you just be in prayer?
See, this, this particular thing helps me and this prayer journey helps me because I, I, I was talking to my wife going into this because I knew that we were going to start this journey last November. So I was talking to my wife. I go, baby, I got a number in my heart, and it's really big. It was by far the biggest gift we'd ever given. It, it, was, it was a big stretch. And when I was sitting down with the gentleman who's helped us with our first two campaigns, who understands just the, the math of how we get there, and he was showing us certain sizes gifts and what we're going to need to get, I saw a number, and the Holy Spirit said, that's you. And I go, Lord, that's 150% bigger than the first number I had. And he goes, yeah, I couldn't start there. I had to start at the first number because the second one would have freaked you out. <laughs> but once you got comfortable with the first one, you were now in a position for the second one. And I was like, oh, wow, that's how you do it. Okay, <laughs> praise God. So I call my wife and I go, Lord, you're going to have to talk to her because this is really, really big. Like this is way beyond whatever I thought. And God says, you know how to tr trust me. I'm, yeah, I do. I'm not worried. So I call my wife. I go, hey, baby, are you sitting down? You need to. Uh, this is what I think God just told us to do. She goes, praise God, let's do it. I go, you don't want to fight about it first? Because if we fight about it, then I can go back to God. We can maybe renegotiate that number. <laughs> she goes, no, God said it, we do it. We can't out give God. Amen. I'm like, ah, oh, awesome. So I, I had a number. Well, this week I was on an airplane and I was flying back from a pa pastor's retreat and I'm on the plane and God goes, hey, let's look at that number again. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? He goes, I think you can do this. Well, my number went up a lot. For us, it's massive. I'm like, what? And I, so I go, I lean over to my wife. And she got her headphones on. And I start talking to her. And I'm like, she can't hear God, so we're good. <laughs> she goes, because she got headphones on. So I go, hey, baby, guess what? I, I believe we, we can change our number to this. Praise God, let's do it. Will you ever fight with me? <laughs> but I, I can be honest, I have never been more excited about doing something in 18 year history of Element Church than the number that God gave us to give. I, I've, I've walked with God long enough and I've trust God enough that I've never, ever, ever, ever been able to outgive God. And here's what I know. I'm taking that which is corruptible, I'm taking monopoly, and I'm moving it into that which is eternal. And I know God will bless me this side of heaven, but I know this. I'll never stand before God, or I'll never be on my deathbed and go, could I get my pledge back? <laughs> Dang, I gave too much. Never. I'll probably think I should have done more. Because when eternity's in front of you, you realize that which truly matters. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Jesus, we thank you that you can get it to us, that we can trust you, that we can live open-handed because you truly have infinitely more than all we can ask or imagine. But we have to step into your ways. And that way is a way of faith. That is a way of surrender. That's a way of simply trusting you. So Father, all of us are at a different point in our journey. We thank you for that, that, that new believer who's just really taking those first steps of faith. Thank you for them. For those who've walked with God for years, who understand this, who are saying, God, here I am, use me again. And all of us in between. God, I thank you that you have infinitely more individually for them. You have infinitely more for this church. We trust you. That where you guide, you provide. That the 10 million is your vision. And therefore, you'll bring provision to fulfill your vision. We can trust you. Lord, I pray for someone who's maybe here at one of our campuses, there online, who doesn't know Christ, that right now, where they are, they'd be able to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I'm gonna ask just for a moment, nobody move. There online, there at our campuses, if you don't know this Christ, Jesus died for you, he rose from the dead for you. The thing he wants to give you greater than any one thing is salvation. You can't earn it, you simply receive it by accepting Christ. I'd love to lead you in that prayer. Bible says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Would you join in with us and pray that? Maybe you've been away from God. You can come back to God with this prayer. Let's say this together, church. Jesus, thank you that you love me, that you died for me, that you paid the price for my sins, and that you rose from the dead. I confess I can't save myself. I surrender my heart, my life, to you. You're my Savior, and you're my Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray.
Amen. Amen. Church, let's give them a big hand clap.